and Karen, how are you? Good morning. I am at home. <laughs> yeah, I can see the piano in the background with Tiger Paul marks on it for the kids. I can see that as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, yeah, I'll buff those later. I've got time to do that during lockdown, don't I? You do. Yeah. So how's it going for you? Look, um, it's going okay. I mean, oh, look, we've got homeschooling again, uh, but that starts on Monday. To be honest, I think we've adjusted pretty well. It's it's not it's nothing. You know, there's no shock to us um, as a family. Um, but um, I think. We're pretty, I think as overall, generally, people are pretty resilient and carrying on and they know what to do and we'll get through it. If everything's done right in the next seven days, hopefully it's seven days. How, how are you going? Oh, look, I, I, I put out the early Pilates warning for people. We've got Amy and woke her up early in Malaysia to do our virtual Pilates and we had three quarters of the team arrive. So we've increased our program of sort of Pilates and yoga for things and people are really adopted and there's a strong and positive attitude we've put out the 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 question what are you going to do during lockdown because i think we've got to hit something karen we've got to achieve it mm. i've got a seller of 1200 bottles of wine one of the things i'm going to achieve is to not drink during lockdown not drink during lockdown is that, because you, can't, is that because you can't go out andrew no i can go i can go inside the cellar and shut the door and i can drown in it but i'm not going to do it i'm going to show strength I've got lots of books. Anyway, <laughs> we'll try, we might try that again, hey? Yeah, you're going to put that to stop the kids coming through the doors. Exactly. Okay, now look, we, we better kick off, haven't we, because we're on time. And I thought, interesting set of cases today. Um, a week or so ago, we talked about Sphere Health and selecting a group of employees to terminate an enterprise agreement. And we're, you know, use my father's expression, being too smart by half. And the court said, no, no, you're really trying to get around using the employees who, yes, you've stood them down or they've been made redundant, but you are going to engage them again. Bascalis is was an international business that worked on external rigs, uh, offshore rigs and onshore rigs. They've not been able to do any work for the last year and a half on offshore rigs. And they've got an enterprise agreement that's designed for offshore rigs, which made them uncompetitive when they started doing onshore work. And they went to the commission and made application based on public interest tests to the commission and said, look, we need to terminate this agreement because we're actually uncompetitive. And the commission welcomed them with open arms and said, yeah, look, you've turned up, you've shown other enterprise agreements, you've shown the tendering, you've failed. You've been candid with us and you are right. And you're not going to be employing anyone in the near future and this enterprise agreement is killing you. And therefore they terminated. I guess this is one of the things you and I talk about regularly the importance of coming clean to the commission and not trying to be too sneaky. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what's different about this lot, or oh, this example, was that they did apply directly to the commission and didn't go around that whole, well, let's get so many employees uh, who we're close right. with and try and get something through, so. Yeah, and look, this is a lesson for a whole lot of our businesses who are now, because of COVID, actually readjusting what is the work they do. And so some people have moved away from manufacturing to wholesale warehousing work. Well, of course, the manufacturing award's totally inappropriate and damages them in those circumstances. And all enterprise agreements don't work. And we're already, you know, last year, we were very close to making application for manufacturer, but suddenly their work flowed through the door because they're one of those types of manufacturers where everyone wanted their goods. So think about it if you're out there. Think if the method in which you're working has changed dramatically and your enterprise agreement leaves you I'm unable to compete, this is a great case for you. The next case I want to talk to you about is Gibson and Comcare. Um, I think probably one of the most important workers' comp cases we've had for a while, not because it creates new law, but it reminds us what are the defences that are available in stress claims. And we know what the three defences are. One, the person doesn't suffer a psychological injury. Second, work wasn't a cause of that injury. And finally, um, reasonable management action. But what Gibson says is, well, you don't get to have the defence of reasonable management action if what caused the work was loading the person with work. So it isn't about performance managing them. And now this is just so important for what we're doing now with flexible work, where people are assuming more work, more work is being given to them. They're having to manage without being in the office. And as a result of that, their workload is increasing. And what the AAT found, which is the, the tribunal is, you don't get to run as an employer a defence of reasonable management action because you're trying to do the right thing by them. You've increased the volume of work on this person and it's damaged them. Now, I think last week and, and the week before, Karen, we 
you talked about three layers of capability and actually assessing what are the roles people have based on what the organisation needs, what is the function need, and what does the person need to do. What's happened with remote work is everyone's thrown the rules out the window and they're just shoving work at people. And this permeable thing between home and work has meant people are working more. So this is a case that says, no, no, pull back a little bit, be really careful and focus on what is a person's job and don't keep ladling a bit of extra work on because we've lost a couple of people, a couple of people are sick, we won't replace those people. Understand it will affect workers' comp. And when a site claim like this comes in, say you've got a remuneration of $5 million, anywhere in Australia, that's a half million to three quarter million dollar hit on your premium. It doesn't make sense, does it, not to employ the person that you needed to support? Yeah, absolutely. And I think the other thing that it goes to is, again, we've talked about this many times before. Um, yes, managing workloads, making sure that the capability is there, making sure that the communication engagement is there. Just because you can't see people doesn't mean that you stop managing people. doesn't mean you stop talking with people, understanding what it is that they need and um, what, what support might be useful um, and meaningful at that point in time. And Karen, both of us, in both businesses, both the, the legal business and in the consulting business, we've both been dealing with circumstances of saying to people, now look, you have changed the method by which you're working. You do need to do a risk assessment. You do need to look carefully at how work is allocated, how it's managed, and what is the support you give someone. You do need to understand as people work more and more remotely, their psychological health is going to be um, more marginal and higher risk. And therefore, as part of your risk assessment process, you've got to have some forms of intervention that work around it. And we are, you know, again, two weeks ago, we gave you the data around workers' comp claims, which are now starting to peak and will continue to peak with remote work. But what sits behind all this is lack of clarity around what is your job and the gradual absorption of work. You're, you're young, Karen, remember that? You're young, I'm old. But when I started work, um, Above me as a principal, I, as a principal, I had two secretaries and I had these layers of people who did work for me, all of whom have gone now. That's the same in every single business. So we've gradually over time absorbed. Now we've improved through technology, take a lot of that work away as well. But make no mistake, all of us have absorbed the level of work which wasn't there 20 or 30 years ago. This recent stirring up of what we're doing with flexible work means once again, there's a bit of extra work that has been pushed towards people to manage because you're not at work, you're between work, between different parts. So look, really helpful case. And I just remind you, be careful, go back, manage people, assess what their risks are and engage people with this flexible work. And what better reminder could we have in Victoria than a lockdown where both you and I have spent the last 24 hours connecting with all people in our firm to make sure they're feeling safe and happy when they're at home. Last case for our case study type of thing is WorkSafe um, Western Australia, MT and Withers, which was a roof incident that occurred seven metres off the ground. The two employees, one died, one was very seriously injured when they fell from a roof that collapsed in a high wind. They weren't anchored in any way, so they didn't have harnessing. They didn't have competency to actually do it. One of them didn't even have a white card to be working on site. This was under the old um, OSHA Act in Western Australia. They've now adopted the model, the model Act. Um, Mr. Withers, the director who was responsible for this, ended up getting sentenced to two years and two months jail with eight months on the bottom end. Highest ever sentence in Western Australia for what is a type of reckless endangerment that exists in Western Australia. If that happened in South Australia now, we would have seen um, a, a really quite sub substantial um, prison sentence, the fines end up being $650,000 for the organisation. It's worth remembering in Western Australia, we're now moving to up to 10 years jail, uh, it 10 years, 20 years jail and 10, $10 million fines that exist in WA under the new legislation. I think the interesting part about this case is one, um, please don't anyone think in Australia you now are safe because you're in a jurisdiction. Western Australia is in a, has always been a benign jurisdiction. They only have Two inspectors over there, it might be more now, but that was a year or two ago. Um, very under-resourced, they're very slow to move. Their old, old OSHA Act was a very old act and the fines and penalties that came out were, were really piddling, just like they were in South Australia 10 years ago. Now South Australia is one of the highest fining um, states in Australia. 
So what's happened with the new legislation is the judiciary is starting to get it and they're starting to say, look, if you do stuff that you know is dangerous and just reckless about it, we're, we're going to deal with you. And this is a very substantial, you know, eight months definite jail, but up to two years and two months is a very, very significant penalty um, and the highest ever under that legislation. So imagine what's going to happen in that jurisdiction when we start to see the model legislation coming through. Just a reminder to everyone, you know, swims, Karen, how often do we talk about swims? Going through and saying, what do I need to go onto this site is the very first start of the swims. Before you even get on the site, what is the qualification certification that allows a person to enter? I'm working at heights. What do I need to do? Gee, I need to make sure people are harnessed and safe when they're up there. Yes. And it's pretty straightforward stuff, isn't it? But repeatedly organised organisations are treating swims like standard operating procedures. And so they just come on and they, they say, okay, we've got a swims. Mm. In fact, what they've got is something that applied in another job, not this job. So what do you think about all that anyway? Look, I think, um, look, it, it, it's, it's simple, but it's not easy. And I appreciate that organisationally it comes back to your safety management system overall, which for which um, hazard management risk assessment forms a really big part of. Um, and the thing is that if you're, if there's question around how sound or robust your safety management system is, then I think you can't, the longer you delay work in, in terms of um, addressing those concerns, the greater the risk. And as you're seeing what's happening in Western Australia, um, there is that appetite and that recognition to, to, to hand down penalties um, and jail terms and fines and all that stuff um, if you don't get it right. Mm, and we're seeing that growth. So when we look at reckless and gross, um, gross negligence, which is the term under the old act there. But when you look at reckless endangerment, we've now got um, 12 sentences over the last two years that have involved jail. That's because prior to that, there was only one that was all the drilling in Victoria, only one, and that was wholly suspended. So we've now showing in every jurisdiction across Australia, a real willingness to imprison people. Not where we want to go, but just remember, before you allow someone to start a job, you've got to be satisfied they're competent. They've got to be, if they require certification, they've got to have that certification. Um, and to your question, Mark, yes, there are a number of people presently doing jail time. And there are some people under uh, the Crimes Code, um, where people have been put in for manslaughter under Crimes Code. And if we go to South Australia as an example, there is a head of a tracking company, he's got another seven years, what's called, it's got another six years to serve from his eight and a half year sentence. So let's move on. We promised, and I've taken up far too much time actually with that discussion, to talk about a, the ageing workforce. Karen's going to talk to you in just a second about the strategy and talk you through what that is. There's just been a fascinating case that's come through in the last day, which is um, Qantas and Summers. Again, another pilot who was required to mandatorily um, retire at the age of 65 based on international conventions but the international conventions only affect European travel effectively. And he mainly did domestic then. There's a High Court case of Christie that says it's reasonable to require someone to um, be terminated because they can't be fit for the inherent requirements of the job because they can't land. And it's unfair for Qantas to go through a rostering process to give them only short trips and that disadvantages other pilots. And that's what the discrimination legislation is about. But in Summer's case, he was doing domestic work and he was flying a plane, he was totally fit to fly and he wasn't impacting the organisation. So what I'm trying to say out of this case is this push towards making older people retire, I want you to understand the jurists that exist now are a younger generation than the Christie generation. And they will openly try and seek alternative work for people and they will challenge you as the reasonableness of it. I thought that might be a nice precursor into moving what Karen's talking about. When we look at a workforce and we say, look, we have got some real problems, we do have this ageing workforce that Karen went through and gave you a whole lot of data on last week. We are going to have to change the way we work with older people who are no longer able to do some of those jobs and to change the mindset because the, the jurists aren't going to let you get away with it. You've got to change your mindset towards how do I do this flexibly. So Karen, over to you, and you're going to share an information graphic, not today, but send directly out to people. Maybe if you could talk to that now, though. Yeah, sure. I'm not sure whether or not we've got it up to, to load, um, but um, you what you will get, oh, here we go, like magic, 
Now, one of the things before I start on this, one of the things I don't miss about lockdown is having um, my spouse working at home with me and lots of children jumping upstairs. So if you hear some racket, that's definitely me. So, um, so this slide here, I've got seven elements to managing an aging workforce. Look, they're, they're not meant to be step by step in, the, in any particular order, but together they form the elements that you need to consider in terms of managing um, the risks and the opportunities around an aging workforce. Firstly, we spoke last week around the capability assessment and understanding what, cap what capability do we have, do we need um, against what we have across the organisation functions and requirements. From that, you're going to be able to identify or create um, risk profiles based on age demographics. Um, and from that, you'll be able to monitor what is the actual risk, um, conduct your risk assessment and identify the appropriate controls um, for each risk profile. From there, it needs to be about, you need to create an economic case or a business case for change. What is the investment? What is the change? And then, and that's not just one thing. The strategy itself may involve several different programs and initiatives, um, and we need to have some timelines and actions around that. So it may mean that it might be uh, a strategy that gets launched all at once, but you might have it in phases. So it, again, it will be different for, from organisation to organisation and certainly uh, from industry to industry, because as I mentioned on last week's um, slides, there are certain industries that um, uh, you know, are, are more um, exposed than others at this point in time. Um, there is the issue around critical risk management as well. So where there is um, a particularly high risk in terms of a, a particular um, group, how, what process do we have in terms of managing those, um, those people and employees? So whether in terms of and I warned you, so you can probably hear them in the background now. So I'll be quick about this. So yeah, we need to have a process around that. Employee support, oh dear. Employee support and structure. Um, so we help employees transition with the change. Sometimes that actually involves, let's not, let's recognize the, the importance of family in that piece as well. And um, consultation, which, you know, is not a standalone thing, happens all throughout. I'm gonna go on mute now and Andrew, you're gonna talk because my kids are going crazy. Okay, now I'm going to take over. So look, I think what Karen and I wanted to talk about was there are two parts to this. There is the internal part and external part. The internal part requires you to drill down and individually consult and engage people about what they want to do in the future, to provide them the information so they can make those proper decisions and to support them through a process of change, which is very dramatic for those people. The external part's a bigger piece. It's the business strategy. So what is it you need? But it must come through this lens of flexibility, not they no longer work, any, they're no longer fit anymore, let's get rid of them. You can see the courts are not going to adopt or accept that strategy. And also it's a moral issue, which is actually we don't do that to our people. We need to maintain skills. We need to maintain deep internal knowledge. And we also need to show that we have a respectful path of moving people towards their retirement in a way that acknowledges who they are to our business. Many of these there's people. A, there's a cost price to that as well, Andrew. People, you know, people aren't silly. Employees see what happens in terms of that pathway, and that's how you're going to treat your most loyal and hard, you know, most loyal, um, long-serving employees. That's not a good sign for anyone to, right. to see. You don't what, have. It, what it does mean is it's going to industrialize if you do that. It's it's going to be have a tax on it, um, and you're going to lose trust. You're going to lose productivity. You're going to lose quality. You're going to lose brand. So I think what Karen's done here is just great because it says to you, look, those sort of steps all collapse together, don't they, Karen? We've talked about seven elements, but they sort of come in together. But what I want to get through this is the importance of consult consultation and knowledge sharing with the people who will be affected. And the idea of seeing the world through their eyes as to where they need to be, and then looking how you can do that inside the organisation. Because I've seen this done incredibly successfully, and I've seen it done catastrophically. And the catastrophic ones are still damaged and still have problems with their staff. So have a look at this. Always reach out to Karen. She's incredibly skilled around this particular issue. And it's a matter which can be done and actually build brand, build productivity, build quality, and build that culture of, look, we can get through this sort of stuff together. And we are strong, resilient, capable people who work together. Good culture. Other one, we fight together, not such a good culture. Let's let's hit, move on to the problem anyway, Soph, if you could load it up. This is very different, isn't it? You and I so far away and Sophie in another place, but nonetheless, Soph, we want the problem. 
I don't know what's happened to our problem. There's our problem. And I think this goes over two pages. So, so Naomi was 69. She had a painful right knee and hip that made walking difficult. Climbing steps was very difficult and painful. Naomi worked as a refrigeration, refrigeration engineer for Colco, a commercial air conditioning refrigeration design construct business for large commercial building projects. She had the title of senior engineer, but until COVID, that title had no supervisory responsibilities. After COVID, she was given the task of making sure the now remote design team, all involved in design and construct work, developed innovative designs that were lowering building costs. There's three things about the growth in a new role. She was naturally a shy woman, enjoyed little respect from the younger or male team. Her skills were more around the look and feel of the products that she designed, not about functionality and detail. She had never worked on site before. As the leader, she now went on site, not the men. Naomi was promoted because Colco's major client, Brollo, loves her work and have a long relationship with her and Colco. She has helped Brollo secure large builds with her innovative designs. We're going to the second part of the, the story. I think we're going to the second part of the story. I can see a hand moving. There we are. Naomi spoke to the MD, Jenny, and explained she didn't feel up to the job. Jenny said, suck it and see. Naomi has struggled terribly with the quantity surveying work. That's breaking it down into detail, working out the costing of each part of it. The men do not respond well or in a timely manner who work with her, and she lacks assertiveness. The team's failures led to liquidated damages claims against Colco and Brollo, and a massive increase in her workload doing things she was just not good at. The union targeted her, saying, saying she was vulnerable. Jenny brushed away Naomi's concerns and repeatedly said in front of others, just get it done, Naomi, no more excuses and similar comments. It was clear her age and health prevented her from safely working on site. Jenny arranged a medical examination to determine whether Naomi was fit for the inherent requirements. If she failed the examination, Naomi was told she would lose her job. Naomi went on stress leave and put in a workers' comp claim. The insurer has three more days to accept or reject it. So we now put up the poll. Once again, Karen, I've asked a couple of questions which are not really fair to people in this. So we'll see how we go. Our numbers are getting up there. I think we'll give it about another um, 20 seconds. All right, I think we've got most of that in now. So let's lock it down, Soph. And we'll end the polling. And what I'll, thanks very much. So the first question, and I'm sorry, I'm just fiddling around with my screen so I can see, will Naomi's workers' comp claim be accepted? For those who said yes, you're absolutely right, because there is no reasonable management action defence. There was no reasonable management action anyway, so it wouldn't have been a defence, was there? Because reasonable management action says, in respect of the performance management, that it was reasonable to do the performance management and that it was done in a fair and a reasonable way. And, and you couldn't say what Jenny did had any of the smell of either of those about it. But in any event, the loading of work on her, work which was unfamiliar, the gradual accretion of stress that went through a period of time brings us straight back to the ComCare case we talked about before. So her claim would be accepted. Was it lawful to require Naomi to undertake the inherent requirements of the job? And look, you're all over the place about that. Some yes, some no, some not sure. And I reckon you're all right. It's a really hard question because this goes back to the case of Zurabas and Mondelez we talked about a week ago. What is Naomi's job? Was it the job she did before? Okay. Was it the job she was asked to do now? Was there at any stage a job description? Now, there's a case called Cosmer and Qantas, which says, at common law, if I get you doing a job for a period of time, it's around about 12 months uh, as, a, as a rule of thumb, that is your job. It's not what's on your job description. So what we know about Naomi absolutely is she was quite capable of doing the job she did 
before she was burdened with this extra work. And therefore, it wasn't lawful to ask her to get her inherent requirements to the job because she was clearly fit for the job she was meant to be doing. Now, that's the twist. That's why it does have the twist in it because they had no lawful basis for saying, um, we want to take test you for the inherent requirements because there's no doubt she was fit for her old job. They just weren't getting her to do her old job. So no, it was not lawful to do it. The next question was Naomi bullied. And I'll just, can I just wander down and have a look what you said? I think she was. I think the repeated saying of stuff in front of other people is derogatory, is tantamount to bullying. There is a case called M and Westpac, which says in robust environments, such as sales teams, the feedback that you give to people and the challenging about um, the level of sales is in a robust environment is not bullying. I don't think it cuts it here. I think that what was said is here we bullied her by the nature of the work we gave her. We bullied her by her not being able to do the work she wasn't capable of doing. Remember, bullying can include giving people work which is beyond their skills. Worth remembering, isn't it? And the last part, of, last question that we come to in all of this is, was there a breach of safety law against Naomi? And what do we say here? So we've got mostly people saying there was. So let's talk about what that breach was. And this brings us back to our earlier conversation. What does reasonable and practicability say? Was there a hazard in respect of Naomi that we identified? Yes, yeah, she was becoming more stressed. And we could see that through her productivity, the quality of her work and her signs of stress. In respect of that hazard, what were the levels of risk? Well, good question put out there. What do you think the levels of risk were? Pretty significant because we've seen an increase in failure, an increase in workload in a person who's nearly not coping with it. So a high level of risk. What was the control? If she was set up to fail, I agree with you, Karen. So the question then is, what is the control? And the control had to be to stop what they were requiring her to do. Because when a risk is very high, you can't use an administrative control. So I can't facilitate a discussion and try and make it better. I've got to stop the pain. And that's not what happened here. So that's bad, isn't it? What happens if we got a little bit more? So we're seeing Naomi becoming um, increasingly distressed. Perhaps we start to see her sad and crying. Perhaps she starts saying she doesn't feel life's very good. She doesn't really like what she's doing in life. And she starts to show some dark thoughts. And they continue her in her job. Where would that end up? If particularly if She's wandering across a road so distracted by it and was struck by a vehicle or, you know, was walking through the site and was struck by a truck. What would happen? Well, the answer is certainly reckless endangerment. And we're close to reckless endangerment here. Can I just say? We are very, very close to reckless endangerment. No one has to die for reckless endangerment. You just have to be, you have to be aware of the risk and careless as to the consequences that come from it. Well, Jenny clearly was. So she's moving towards the withers thing of ending up in jail. But if Naomi died, you've got workplace manslaughter in Victoria and, and in the other states and territories that have industrial manslaughter, much more serious thing. Industrial manslaughter and workplace manslaughter in Victoria was designed around stopping attacks on people's mental health. Because what it says is the place that a person dies does not have to be a workplace. I'm, I'm raising this now because the cases I've given you today are telling you one thing, as far as someone's capacity to do the job goes, the courts expect you to adjust. If you hurt someone and you shouldn't hurt them, you go to jail. If you load people up, they'll have a successful workers comp claim. Do you see what the cases are saying today? They're saying to you, flexible work is here to stay. Manage it, do the risk assessments, ensure people are safe, don't burden them, manage people correctly and do appropriate risk assessments when you change people's workflow. Why do you do that? Because under a safety legislation, the moment you change the way a person works, you must do a risk assessment. The moment there is significant change inside an organisation, movement to flexible work under COVID, the awards say that you must consult. And all the law says, you can't change someone's job without them agreeing to it. Otherwise you terminate their employment. So I know this was a very- 11 a.m. 
It's, it's 11 a.m. Somebody just told me that and I suspect it's my watch. So guys, that's it for today. Thank you very much. Thanks again, Karen, for all your help. And thank you, Sophie, back there. This is, let's hopefully next time we're sitting together because I miss sitting next to you and having a chat. And thank you everyone for coming along. See you later. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone. Bye.